this video is going to get you through the virus chapter, which is chapter 13 in the next uh, Nestor textbook. Um, to start us out, we're just going to kind of go back over what a virus is. I know we've talked about it before, but you need to remember um, viruses are technically not living things because they're not metabolically active unless they are inside a host cell. Viruses tend to be made out of two things. They've got a protein coat, which is blue in this picture, and then some type of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA. This particular one happens to have an RNA core, but some of them instead are going to have DNA. They will never have both. They will either have DNA or RNA. This particular virus is tobacco mosaic virus. It's a virus that infects tobacco plants and it can cause the yellowing of the leaves that you're seeing up over here. So you need to remember viruses don't just infect humans. They can infect any form of life, whether it's a prokaryotic bacterial cell or plant cell or a fungal cell or a human cell. They can do all of that stuff. Mm. Um, can you see a typical virus in our microscope? So no, they are tinier than even the prokaryotic cells. And remember how difficult it is for you guys to find the prokaryotic cells and viruses are smaller than that. So what this picture is trying to show you is the size comparison between all the cell types. You've got the eukaryotic cell, which is this big cell that has a nucleus in it. You've got the prokaryotic cell that's inside of this and it's smaller than the eukaryote. And then the virus is this little bitty speck right here. It's super teeny tiny. Next bacteriophage or just phage for short. These are viruses that infect bacteria. I always kind of love looking at them under a microscope because they look seriously like little alien docking ships. They've got tails that help them stick to the bacteria and then they've got a head. So all these little greeny blue things on the surface of the cell, those are all phages that are infecting this bacterial cell. Um, why are viruses difficult to study in lab? Um, so whenever we study something in lab, we want to have a pure culture of it. Like if we're going to be studying E. coli, we want to grow just E. coli on a plate. The problem with viruses is you can't do that because you have to have a living cell in order for a virus to grow. So by definition, you can't have a pure culture of a virus um, growing in a lab. You have to have a cell for it to infect. And so there's got to be at least two things in there. Now the fancy term for that is they are obligate intracellular parasites. Again, kind of using that word in a different way, it means they're obligated to be inside of a cell if you're going to be studying them or they're going to be kind of functioning as living things for that moment. Um, this little gif that you're seeing here is showing you how viruses actually get into host cells. They have to attach to receptors on the cell and then trick the cell into allowing the virus in. Now this particular one happens to be what's known as an enveloped virus. So in addition to the protein and the nucleic acid core, it also has a lipid envelope. Not all viruses do that, but this one happens to have one. Um, next up, some basic terms. So a virion is one viral particle, so it's one complete virus. So this is that tobacco mosaic virus, that would be a virion. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this one, an adenovirus, it's their viruses that very often cause respiratory infections. So this one happens to be a naked virus, but that is still one virion. And then this is the weird phagey stuff, that whole entire structure with the tail and the head, that's all going to be a virion. Um, a capsid is the protein coat that a virus has. And so in this picture, it's the purpley stuff. It's the outside coating of the viral particle or the virion. And this, I'm not sure if they're trying to make that a color, but all of these little blacky gray things on the outside, that's the capsid. And then on the complicated phage shapes, only this stuff up here ends up making the capsid. The nucleocapsid is the protein coat plus the nucleic acid inside of it. And so this whole structure with the nucleic acid inside is the nucleocapsid. Next. Enveloped versus naked viruses, I've kind of alluded to this before. Um, so in this particular virion, it just has the capsid and then the nucleic acid. So this is a nucleocapsid and that's all there is to that particular virus. But some viruses get an envelope around them, which is made out of lipid bilayer. So here is our nucleocapsid and then there's the envelope outside of that. If there's an envelope outside of the protein coating or the capsid, it's said to be an enveloped virus. If it doesn't have that, it's a naked virus. Now, the way that we have talked about these terms before is enveloped viruses, they're counterintuitive. You would think because they have an additional layer, they have an additional layer of protection, but it's actually easier to kill an enveloped virus because lipid layers are easier to break up than protein coats are. So naked viruses are more difficult to kill. They're more resistant to germicides. Um, envelope viruses are easier to deal with. Mm -hmm. What type of virus tends to be easier to kill with disinfectants? 
Yeah, just said that uh, this. It's the enveloped viruses are easier to kill. The naked ones tend to be a little bit more resistant to those things. Can viruses contain both DNA and RNA? No, they will either have one or the other. Um, so some viruses are DNA viruses, some viruses are RNA viruses. It just depends on which particular group of viruses you're looking at, which one of those two things they're going to have inside of them. And this happens to be a little cartoony picture of the flu virus. It has eight little chromosomes off inside of it. Um, so they don't have to just have one molecule of either DNA or RNA. They can have multiple chromosomes just like cells can in some cases, and the flu virus happens to have eight. Um, let's see, questions that I usually ask as I'm showing you this, uh, which of these is an isometric virus? So isometric means kind of the same shape all the way around, so it's symmetrical. Um, so the adenovirus is an isometric virus. Uh, which is a prokaryotic cell? B is, because E. coli is a prokaryotic bacterial organism. Um, that's all the questions I kind of had, but human red blood cell, that's eukaryotic. Even though it doesn't have a nucleus, it can still have some of the other membrane-bound organelles still present in it although it's mostly really just hemoglobin, but it's still gonna be bigger than a prokaryotic cell. And then this is just showing you several different shapes that viruses can take. Mm -hmm. Next, we're gonna kind of recreate this table inside of your notes. And so as I go, I'm sure too fast through all of this stuff, just go back to this table if you ended up missing something. Um, to start us out, enteric. Anytime you see that word enteric, it basically means gut. And so enteric viruses are viruses that get into the body through the GI system. It means you drink contaminated water, you ate contaminated food. Um, this also, one of the other mechanisms of transmission, it's my favorite because it's oh so gross, it's what's known as the fecal oral route of transmission, which means you somehow got somebody else's poop inside of your mouth, which means all of the bacteria and viruses and um, whatever protocysts that were in that person's poop, you now have that inside of your system. And so those are um, enteric viruses. Now we are gonna be talking just about viruses. There's also enteric bacteria, there's enteric protists, but we're gonna try to be focusing on just the viruses as we're talking about the virus chapter here. So some examples of enteric viruses, polio. Um, polio is not one that we see in the United States, but it is still endemic in several countries. Mm every time. I'm going to just kind of ignore my phone and hope that that stops ringing. Okay, um, what that means is when there's a polio outbreak in a specific place, you get it by drinking contaminated water. So a person who has polio, when they poop, they release some of that virus into the water. And if the city has poor sanitation, it gets into the drinking water. And so you get an outbreak in the whole town as a result of that contaminated water. Now, if you don't remember polio from a &P or your freshman class, remember that's a virus that attacks the nervous system. So any damage done is permanent, but it is still an acute virus, which we'll talk about later on. Um, one of my favorite virus names, Coxsackie B virus, that causes hand, foot, and mouth disease, which is usually seen in kids. Um, noroviruses and rotaviruses, those tend to cause GI symptoms like diarrhea, vomiting, that sort of thing. So anything that tends to cause that kind of symptom is going to tend to be an enteric virus. But remember, polio doesn't cause diarrhea and vomiting. Polio causes paralysis in certain limbs, depending on which spinal nerves ended up getting infected by that virus. Mm -hmm. um, next up. Respiratory viruses, um, the mechanism of transmission is the respiratory route, so you end up breathing the particles in. Um, there can also be a salivary route associated with this, and so that could be somebody sneezed directly in your face and got some of their saliva into your eyes. It can get in that way. Um, there's also like a sharing of cigarettes or straws or things like that. You can transmit things that way, and it can be considered respiratory. Uh, for respiratory viruses, you've got flu is one of the more common ones. Common cold is another one, which most common colds are caused by rhinoviruses, although there are other viruses that can cause the common cold. Measles is, an, is another one that um, is transmitted through the respiratory route. Let's see. Zoonotic. Anytime you see that term zoonotic, it means it's being transferred from an animal into people. There's two subdivisions of that. There's a vector which we'll define that more a little bit later, but basically it means there's some sort of an animal that is spreading the infection without actually getting sick from the infection. And then there's zoonotic with direct contact, which means you touched a sick animal and then you got sick and you ended up with whatever that infection was. Um, for zoonotic with a vector, what I want you to know for the mechanism of transmission is that the vector is very often an arthropod. 
for my A and P people, what arthropod means is essentially buggy sort of things like insects. Um, very often it's something like a biting thing, like a mosquito, a tsetse fly, anything that can break human intact skin can spread infection um, once they do that. Some examples of zoonotic with effector, um, in our area we get West Nile virus every summer. Um, it's a mosquito that spreads West Nile virus. Um, in very far south Texas and in lots of other places in the world, there's dengue fever, that's D-E-N-G-U-E. Uh, dengue is also spread by a mosquito, the same mosquito that happens to spread stuff like chikungunya and Zika also spreads dengue. Dengue happens to be a really scary viral infection because unlike most viral infections where you get it, you get better and then you're immune to it, and dengue, if you get infected with it a second time, it can kill you the second time because you end up with a more severe immune response that can actually be fatal. And so dengue is not one you really want to play around with. Uh, sandfly fever is another one that your book mentions at that point. Um, I've got a little video to show you for zoonotic with a vector. First isolated in Uganda in 1937, West Nile outbreaks had occurred in Africa, Europe, and the Middle East. But West Nile had yet to make a visit to the Western Hemisphere. Until now. When I pulled my books out, there was very little written about this virus because it wasn't a common virus in the United States. All scientists know that West Nile virus is officially destroying humans and birds from the inside out. And one in six of the city's mosquitoes are carriers of the disease. This was a new virus in a new ecology. And so we had no idea what mosquitoes could transmit it. We had no idea what animals would be susceptible to it. I mean, it's a fairly lethal virus. Although the St. Louis encephalitis diagnosis had been wrong, New York's massive mosquito control measures were effective in slowing the spread of West Nile. I'm going to stop that one there. Now, we will talk about West Nile again in more detail, um, but the mosquito is the vector for West Nile virus. West Nile, in most healthy adults, causes very few symptoms, like it's kind of flu-like symptoms, and a lot of people are actually asymptomatic. However, the virus, it's kind of like COVID. Some people's body overreacts to the virus and causes massive inflammation that can lead to encephalitis, which is swelling of the brain, and then it can be fatal if that happens and lead to permanent disability if the person ends up recovering from it. And so we have massive mosquito spraying campaigns whenever West Nile any of the mosquitoes that get tested are positive, we do spraying so that we can reduce that number because we're trying to make sure people don't end up getting it. Next, zoonotic with direct contact. This is again a sick animal. You contacted a sick animal and the most common example of this is rabies. So if you go petting some animal that has rabies and it bites you, you end up getting rabies from that. And so that's one example. Cowpox is another one. Um, trying to think of some other ones. Ringworm, although that's not a viral infection, that can be spread in this direction through direct contact as well. I don't think humans can get parvovirus um, like dogs can, but if that were to be able to be transmitted from dogs into people, then that would be another one that could be zoonotic with a, a direct contact. Hmm. Next, sexual transmission is sexual transmission. You touch somebody in their genital region and you end up with some sort of virus. Um, so this is herpes in the initial stages. You get little red bumps. That's uh, herpes simplex virus type 2. Um, herpes simplex type 1 is the one that causes cold sores, usually around the mouth. HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, that's a sexually transmitted virus. HPV is a sexually transmitted virus. There's several of those viral STDs out there. Um, Next, I give you guys this link within the notes so that you can watch it as often as you want to, but I've got this little video that I wanted to show you that shows you how viruses end up getting into a cell and causing an infection. Now, oh darn it, and of course the link doesn't want to work. I'll try to find where they've moved that to. HHMI likes to move things around to new places, and I'll post that link for you, the newer version of it. But essentially what needs to happen for a virus to be able to infect a cell is it has to be able to attach to a receptor on the outside surface. This is what gives virus specificity. Like again, you can't get certain viruses that dogs can get. Like you can't, I'm trying to think of something a dog can get right now that you can't get. 
or vice versa. I guess I can go in the opposite direction. Like if you get the flu, you can still have your puppy kiss, kiss you because you can't give the flu to your dog because it can't, the dog doesn't have the same receptors that you have. And so if the receptors aren't present, it can't end up infecting you. If it can attach to a receptor though, that tricks the cell into allowing it in. Now, one of the differences between bacterial viruses and eukaryotic viruses, um, and by that I don't mean a virus that is eukaryotic, I mean a virus that can infect eukaryotic cells, is for viruses, the whole virus doesn't enter the cell. It just kind of squirts its DNA into the bacterium and then tricks the bacterium into making what that nucleic acid codes for, which is viral proteins. In a eukaryote, the entire virus enters the cell, and so that is one of the differences between bacterial viruses and then viruses that infect eukaryotes. Um, from there, there's two options that can happen. The virus can directly hijack the cell and trick that cell into making lots of little virus babies to the point where it actually pops the cell and the cell releases a whole bunch of viral babies at once. That's called a lytic cycle when that happens. The other thing that can happen is the viral DNA can get, or RNA, um, if it's RNA, it has to be reverse transcribed first, but whatever. Um, it gets incorporated into the host genome, so it makes some recombinant DNA where we've got bacterial DNA and a little bit of viral DNA. And then it just sort of hides in here and waits for conditions to be ripe for the viral infection to take place. So that's how viruses work. They get into the cell and then trick the cell into making what the virus wants the cell to make and not what the animal or bacteria wants to be able to make. So a lytic phage is what does this top infection right here. Now, if you don't remember what lice means from a previous science class, it means that you pop a cell open. So in the lytic infection cycle, what happens is the virus inserts its nucleic acid, the host cell starts to read that nucleic acid and make viral proteins. It then starts to assemble those viral proteins into new viruses until there's so many viruses inside the cell that the cell pops to release those. So a lytic infection ends up resulting in a productive infection and it's called productive because the host cell is producing lots of virions or lots of virus particles. Um, let's see, after that you have described the five steps. So every time your book comes out with a new edition, they change the number of steps by merging and unmerging different parts. So when I took the picture from the book, they had six steps. What they did is they merged steps three and four. And so it made this all one thing. So ignore the fact that our stuff is different. And here's what we got. Step one for a phage to infect a bacterium is it has to be able to attach to receptors on the outside of that cell. And again, that gives us specificity. So some viruses can infect E. coli, but they can't infect streptococcus. And that's because the receptors are different on the outside of those cells. Once the phage can attach to receptors, step two is it penetrates the nucleic acid into the prokaryotic cell. What I called this earlier was it squirts the nucleic acid into the cell. So remember the capsid part stays outside and only the nucleic acid enters the cell. From there, steps three and four are what the current version of the book merged together. So the cell starts to transcribe. Um, if it was a DNA genome, it transcribes the DNA into RNA. Um, if it was an RNA genome, then we just start the process of translating it into DNA. So it kind of does depend on which type of nucleic acid the virus happened to have in it. But at this point, we again become a virus making factory inside of that cell. So transcribe and translate it into proteins. Step five, now that we've got all these proteins floating around inside the cell and more nucleic acid that we've made, we need to assemble those into new virions. And so step four in the current version of the book is assembly. After we've assembled the virions, we release them. So this is the lice part where we pop open the cell and all these little virions leave the cell. So that's how viruses get into and infect cells. And one of the things that's kind of important to understand is if a host cell gets infected by a virus, it's doomed. It's going to end up dying at some point, either immediately when we have a lytic infection or later on down the road if we have a lysogenic infection. Oh yeah, I forgot I had these all in here. I'm going to skip past all these. Next thing you have in your notes is burst size. Burst size is how many viruses end up being released when the host cell ruptures and releases all those virus particles. 
this is different between different species of bacteria and different viruses being infected. You guys have seen some prokaryotes under the microscope now, so you should recognize the fact that Micrococcus is a much smaller cell than E. coli happens to be. Well, that means the burst size is going to be smaller on Micrococcus than it was for E. coli, just because the size of the cell is a lot smaller. So it's different between different organisms, but the burst size is how many viruses get released when the cell lysis. Hmm. Next. A temperate phage can be either lytic or lysogenic, so it can either hide inside the cell or it can cause an immediate infection. They can do either or. A lysogenic infection is the type of infection that happens when the virus inserts its nucleic acid in and that nucleic acid just gets incorporated into the host genome. The viral part becomes what's known as a prophage, so that's just the virus part of the host chromosome. Um, Phage induction, <coughs> pardon me. The example that I'm gonna give you for this relates to herpes because most people have had a cold sore at some point in their life. When you have infection from the herpes virus, you always have an infection, but you don't always have a cold sore. What happens is the herpes virus gets into your cells and if you're healthy, your immune system keeps them hidden. And what they've done is they've inserted their genome into yours so that you've got that prophage inside of your stuff. So it's just hiding. The moment it senses weakness in you, like you're getting stressed or you haven't eaten in a while or you're sick with something else, the virus seizes that opportunity. It kicks the prophage out in something called phage induction. And then we start that process of a lytic infection where we go ahead and start mass producing viral proteins, assemble them, and then we have that lice at the end. So phage induction is when you switch sort of a dormant virus into an active lytic virus. <clears throat> okay. Um, study figure 13.6 to help you understand the two things that a virus can do inside of a cell. More than likely that's a picture that looks something like this inside the book. So again, you can do a lytic infection, which is an active infection, a productive infection where you're going to be releasing a lot of virus. Or you can do the lysogenic infection um, where you're not actively producing anything until phage induction occurs. Mm -hmm. um, define lysogenic conversion. A lot of times when a virus inserts its genome into a host cell, it gives that host cell genes that it did not have before, and it allows that host cell to start to make proteins that it didn't make in the past. What we're looking at here in this picture is an infection that we don't see very often anymore because there's a vaccine for it. It's part of the Tdap or DTaP vaccine. This is diphtheria. Well, the bacteria that causes diphtheria only causes the pseudomembrane to form that you're seeing at the back of this person's throat if the diphtheria bacteria has been infected with a virus because the virus is what allows the bacteria to produce the toxin that causes this pseudomembrane to form in the back. So lysogenic conversion is what makes the diphtheria bacteria very pathogenic in human beings. Um, any bacteria that has picked up some toxin from a viral infection, that ends up resulting in lysogenic conversion. So how did your book phrase this? It's a change in the phenotype of a virus infected cell because of the phage. Some other examples, um, we had talked about Shiga toxin before. That's a toxin that some strains of E. coli can produce. The strains that produce it have undergone lysogenic conversion. The strains that can't make Shiga toxin, they're just normal old E. coli. So it's lysogenic conversion that allows them to make that toxin. We talked about Botox before from Clostridium botulinum. That's a case of lysogenic conversion. And one thing that we haven't talked about yet, scarlet fever is a complication that can happen in people who get strep throat. Um, it's characterized by this red rash that occurs over the body, so it turns the person scarlet, essentially. Um, that particular side effect of strep throat, it results from lysogenic conversion in the strep bacteria that cause the strep throat. And so there's a lot of diseases out there that result not just from the bacterial infection, but from bacteria that had a viral infection. So it's like an inception sort of a thing where the virus infects bacteria, which infects you, and now you end up with a disease that you wouldn't have gotten all because we had multiple infectious events. Um, let's see. Explain how bacteria protect themselves against viruses. 
Um, notice that restriction enzymes make a comeback here. So when we talked about restriction enzymes the first time, we were talking about how we can use them to do restriction enzyme digestion to break genes out of a genome. We called them DNA scissors when we talked about them the first time. Well, if a bacterial cell gets infected by a virus, it can make restriction enzymes to cut up that viral DNA. So restriction enzymes are sort of the immune system for a bacterial cell. Because if you cut up the viral DNA, you can't make little baby viruses anymore, and so you can't actually get that lytic infection present. One of the other things that bacterial cells have that's very important, and it's being used a lot more in gene therapy processes, it's called CRISPR. It's all caps, C-R-I-S-P-R. You will also see it called CRISPR-Cas. Um, CRISPR is a gene editing software that, again, is kind of like restriction enzymes, only what happens is we look for a specific sequence of DNA, and then we cut that DNA, and then an enzyme comes in and changes the sequence of that DNA so that it's no longer harmful. And so a CRISPR system can block secondary infections as well. Uh, from here, we're going to switch to start talking about how viruses infect our cells, animal cells, because we are animals, whether you knew it or not. Um, so explain how we, they infect animal cells. And again, I say that dengue fever video that I'm going to look for and find the new link for and post into Schoology for you guys. It should be able to help you out. So they still have to be able to attach to host cell receptors. But one of the things that's different is when they attach to that receptor, it triggers endocytosis. And so instead of just squirting the nucleic acid into the cell, the entire virus comes into the cell. And then from there, we're going to uncoat it, which means we're going to, if it had an envelope, we're going to take that envelope out from inside and just release the nucleocapsid into the cell. And then from there, we have to further uncoat to take the capsid off and release the nucleic acid. And then after that, it's just like the bacteria bacterial viral infection from earlier. So we're going to start to transcribe and translate that into proteins, make more virus. Um, instead of just popping open the cell, in a lot of cases, once a virus gets into an animal cell, we're going to package a lot of virus up into um, a vesicle, and then the vesicle will merge with the membrane and release them in exocytosis instead of just popping the cell open. So that's how they get into us. Um, uncoating is the removal of the capsid to release the nucleic acid. So notice right down here, this was uncoating. We got the nucleic acid out of that capsid. Okay. Next, there's a couple of things that can happen inside of viruses as animal cells are in the process of packaging them up to release them out into the world during a productive infection. We've got antigenic drift and antigenic shift. Now, Drift. If you think about that word drift, it means you're kind of moving slowly. Antigenic drift is an evolutionary process that occurs in bacteria due to mutations in their genome, either during the process of us making them or they got induced through radiation or some other mutagen that got exposed to. But what happens is because of a mutation in the nucleic acid of that virus, the virus changes just a little bit over time. Um, this is one of the reasons why you're, we have to keep updating our vaccines is because the virus can just change over time due to these mutations. And so we have to keep those sorts of things up to date. Um, here's the way your book said antigenic drift. It occurs as the mutations accumulate in viral genes that encode the surface proteins. Remember those surface proteins are what allow a virus to attach to your cell and infect it. So if those change enough over time, that virus will be able to infect a new host. Next, shift. If you shift something, you change it really quickly. It's like taking a step to the left, essentially. If you remember from earlier, I said that the flu virus has eight different chromosomes inside of it. Well, if in the process of assembly, um, you have a cell that got infected with two viruses at once, which happens more often than you would like to think about, during assembly, your cell will take some of this nucleic acid and mix it with some of this nucleic acid and then put that together into one virus. So these had been separate viruses, but now you've kind of merged them all into one and it can now infect new things that it could not infect before. And this happens much faster than the drift up over here. Here's how your book defined drift. Uh, pardon me, shift. I was looking at that. Uh, shift. It involves an exchange of portions of a segmented genome if two strains or more infect the same cell. 
So this is where I want you to think about the flu specifically. Swine flu from several years ago, it jumped into people because in a pig at some point, it did this antigenic shift thing and it combined a couple of different proteins from a couple of different flu viruses and it made a strain of flu that could now also infect people because it had a receptor on it that humans also had. And so that jumped into people and based on the CDC's epidemiology, it did this in Mexico. It was one boy that lived down at a farm, was patient zero, and then from him, because it now had all the receptors that it needed to get into people, jumped into his family who spread it and then it got worldwide all because of this shift so got to have that partitioned genome though you have to have multiple segments to the genome all right already said that one uh, reverse transcriptase is what you have next so the name actually tells you what it does it reverses transcription so if transcription gets you from dna to rna Reverse transcription gets you from RNA to DNA. You go backwards. This is the enzyme that allows that to happen. Viruses that contain the reverse transcriptase enzyme are called retroviruses, and the most notable retrovirus out there is HIV. It has an RNA genome. Once it gets into a cell, the genome plus the reverse transcriptase enzymes backs up transcription so that it can make DNA from RNA and then it can incorporate that DNA into host cells and cause problems with them. Apoptosis is programmed cell death. Um, we have a whole immune system that consists of a bunch of different kinds of cells. Those cells can murder virus infected cells so that they stop releasing little virus particles that's how our immune system takes care of them. So we don't have restriction enzymes like bacteria and our cells don't do CRISPR. Instead, we have a whole organ system, well, it's a whole functional system, I'll say, that is designed to murder virus infected cells. From there, we start to get into some of the definitions that relate to how long a virus can live inside of a body. Acute means that you have the infection, your immune system clears the infection, and then you get all better. So you have it for a little while. Persistent means the infection lasts for months, if not years, after you get that infection. Um, mumps is an acute infection. You get it, it sucks, you get better, and then you no longer shed that virus anymore. It's not hiding in your body, it's just gone. Now, a lot of people think that chicken pox is an acute virus because you get it, you get the rash, and then it seems like you get better, but chicken pox is actually a persistent infection that's called a latent infection. Once you get it, it starts to hide in your body and it can come out later on as shingles. So you don't get shingles as a secondary chicken pox infection. You get it as the same infection you had earlier, but it reactivates inside your body and it comes out as different symptoms than what you had before. All right. Um, for examples of acute infections, I mentioned mumps with this kid up there. Uh, flu is an acute infection. Polio is an acute infection. Now, I do want to make sure you understand acute infections means, again, you get the infection, you get better, and you no longer shed the virus. Doesn't mean you no longer show symptoms. In the case of polio, since it destroyed nervous system cells, you get the virus, you clear the infection, and you no longer shed polio, but the damage to your spinal nerves is permanent, and so you're never going to get that sensation or, not sensation, that movement back in whatever limbs got um, affected by the polio virus, depending on what spinal nerves it ended up affecting. And so the, the paralysis is permanent, but the infection was actually an acute infection. Um, let's see. Describe persistent infections, both chronic and latent. So again, persistent lasts for a long time. Chronic means you continue to have symptoms for a long time. You continue to shed virus for a long time. So you're constantly producing more virions. An example of that is hepatitis, especially hep B and hep C. Um, a latent infection is more what you have with chicken pox. You get it, you shed the virus, you get better, but the virus is still in you, but you stop shedding it. It's just hiding in the case of chicken pox. Um, it's hiding in sensory ganglia within your nervous system. Then it can come back later on. You can get new symptoms and you can shed virus again. So the difference between chronic and latent, chronic, you're constantly shedding virus. Latent, you shed it, you stop shedding it, and then you start shedding it again later on when your immune system got a little bit weaker. Um, other examples of latent infection are the herpes simplex virus, the one that causes cold sores again, or genital um, herpes counts as that, and chicken pox does too. Okay, 
from there. Is that really a question that you guys have? No, it's not in your notes. But why should you cover your mouth when you sneeze? Because, one, just decorum. Don't be a rude person who just sneezes on everybody around you. But, two, when you sneeze, you're flinging out tons of aerosolized whatever was in your system, whether it was allergens, viruses, bacteria, fungi. It's all in there. It's the same basic principle as the cough plates that I had you guys make earlier. You're shedding stuff. Stop. Cover your mouth. Um, wash your hands after you've covered your mouth, but you should cover your mouth with your elbow so that you don't then go touch a bunch of things and spread that crap around. Um, I'm not going to do that one. Uh, this is just a table that kind of shows you a comparison of the viruses that affect bacteria, bacteriophages, and the viruses that can infect animal cells. Those are the only two that your book talk about, really, but again, there are plant viruses and there's fungal viruses. These are just the main two that we're going to talk about because we're in micro and we are animals. All right. Um, then I gave you a little table. I'm a person who likes to study tables because, I don't know, they put everything in ni nice, neat little boxes and it makes it easier for me to study it. So that's why I put a table in your notes. For Hep B and C, they are both chronic infections. The cells involved are hepatocytes in both cases. Um, and really, they both cause the same thing, which is hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. If untreated, that can lead to cirrhosis, which is death of the liver. Um, it can also increase your risk of liver cancer, and so Hep C, there is now a treatment for it. It's crazy expensive, but we do have a cure for Hep C. We do not have a cure for Hep B at this point. Mm -hmm. um, herpes, both type 1 and type 2. These are both latent infections. Remember, that's a type of persistent infection. Both types can infect the neurons of sensory ganglia. The difference between them is typically type 1 causes cold sores around the oral region. Type 2 causes genital ulcers, so on the genital region. They both infect mucous membranes. They're just doing it in different places. And because there's a, you know, oral sex component to a lot of American society, you can get type 2 around the mouth and type 1 around the genitals. So they don't really, I'm trying to make it seem like they're neatly compartmentalized, but they're really not. Mm. Next, varicella zoster is the virus that causes chicken pox, which is a latent infection. It infects satellite cells of sensory ganglia. Um, the first time around you get chicken pox, which is an itchy rash with flu-like symptoms and it super sucks. But when it comes back later in life, usually in your 50s, 60s, um, it comes back as shingles, which is not an itchy rash. Um, I've not had shingles, but I've talked to people that have had shingles, and the way that they describe it is, imagine that this portion of your body is just on fire 24-7. That's what shingles feels like. It feels like a part of your body is on fire, according to people who suffer from it. So it's not itchy. It burns badly. Um, there is a vaccine for this one. Um, there's also a vaccine for hep B. I forgot to mention that earlier. Um, Epstein-Barr is a latent infection that infects B cells, which is one of your types of lymphocytes. Um, the disease that it causes the first time around is mononucleosis, or just mono for short. Um, it is important to understand that it increases your risk of a specific type of cancer called Burkitt's lymphoma. And so having mono earlier increases your risk of that type of lymphoma later in life. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no vaccine for that one. HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, is a chronic slash nowadays latent infection because of the meds that we have. Um, the cells in, involved are helper T cells, and the disease that it causes are AIDS. Um, AIDS, when it first became noticeable, was a fatal disease. If you got it, you were going to die. Nowadays, with um, antiretroviral therapy, we can keep you alive and healthy for decades, and so there are a lot more people living with HIV now than were in the past because treatment allows them to live a life and keep their disease at bay. And we even have PrEP, which is uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis, so that you're less likely to spread your infection to others during sexual activity. Um, influenza is an acute infection. Cells involved were not, it seems to infect a bunch of cell types, but a lot in the respiratory system. And, you know, the disease is flu. You know what flu is because you've all seen a person who had it or maybe you've had it for yourself. Mm. Um, this one has been up a lot in the news lately because we've got another infection that is leading to a pandemic kind of like the Spanish flu of 1918, 1919 did. Um, what I always like to stress when we talk about this is everybody thinks the flu is just like a, a bad cold and everybody just gets better from it. It kills 
thousands of people every single year worldwide. There's a reason why we have a vaccine for it. It's to reduce the deaths that come from flu. And so, especially if you work in the medical profession, you should be getting that flu vaccine because you are less likely to get it. And if you do get it, you're less likely to have severe complications. And so please make sure you're vaccinating yourself to protect yourself from the flu. Um, mumps is an acute infection of the salivary glands. Um, the hallmark symptom of this is swelling of the salivary glands, especially the parotid glands on the sides of the face. It's very painful. You tend to get a fever. Super sucks, but it gets better. Um, I do also want to stress, um, it can lead to problems including encephalitis and sterility in men because it can cause a swelling of the testicles. So even though in most people, again, you get it and you get better, in some people, it can kill them because it gets into the brain and it can cause infertility for the rest of their life if it gets into the testes in men. And so there's reasons we have vaccines for this. It's part of the MMR vaccine. Uh, poliomyelitis is an acute infection that affects motor neurons. Um, the disease it leads to is polio. Different limbs get affected in different people. And so in the case of this young lady, she, both of her legs are unable to move anymore. So this is the kind of walking posture that she has developed to try to help her move around. She wraps her arms around them to get from point A to point B because those legs, they're never going to move again. Um, we got a vaccine for this one. Um, the vaccine that we use in the United States uses a killed virus, so there is no chance of getting polio from the vaccine that we use. But in other places, they still use what's known as the oral polio vaccine, which uses a weakened virus, not a dead virus. And there have been cases where that weakened virus regained its virulence and then caused outbreaks in the areas that we use that. Um, I think the oral polio vaccine is cheaper and easier to use and that's why they use it in those places, but I don't know, I, I kind of wish we'd switch to just using the shot that was the killed virus because there's outbreaks going on in Africa right now that are vaccine derived outbreaks. Last virus that we're going to talk about in this chapter, HPV, human papillomavirus. It's a chronic infection that affects epithelial cells. It leads to warts, um, most notably genital warts, but it can cause problems elsewhere. Um, this virus is also known to lead to penile cancers in men, which is what we're seeing over here. We're at the base of a person's penis. Um, and then cervical cancer in women, which is why I'm showing you what a normal cervix versus um, a precancerous in this particular stage um, cervix should look like if you're looking at a woman's cervix. Mm -hmm. Viroids we talked about a little bit in chapter one. Remember that this is just an infectious RNA molecule and at this point we have only found them infecting plants. Um, plants do have an epidermis. Viroids get in through wounds like a bug ate a leaf. The viroid can get in through that wound that was created by the bug. Um, let's see, in the picture here, I'll just kind of list these off. These are all viroid things. So this is potato spindle tuber, avocado sunblotch, chrysanthemum stunt, and then um, cryclorotic model on D off over there. Prions, we had talked about these in a previous chapter as well. These are infectious proteins that are very, very difficult to eradicate. Um, essentially what happens is the abnormal protein bumps up against a normal protein and changes the shape of the normal protein into an abnormal protein. So they work sort of like enzymes where one bad one can make hundreds of other bad ones from what had been good ones. Um, we first sort of became aware of prions with the mad cow outbreak that happened in England during the 1990s. Um, the story behind this is insane and it's not just England that had problems like this, but what they started to do is grind up some of the offal, which is O-F-F-A-L, of cows. Like they would ground up the hooves and brains and things that they couldn't sell to market and then turn that into cow food. So they were making cows cannibals and unknowingly they were feeding cows prions, which can go from the digestive system to the brain. And then it causes uh, what's known as spongiform encephalopathy. So it creates all these little holes as bad proteins build up in the brain. It eats away at the brain. Um, it has been shown that if people ate cows that had mad cow disease, people can get mad cow disease as well. But when it gets into people, it's called Kretzfeld Jakob disease, um, which again, we talked about in chapter one. Um, my little side note that I have here is by early 2004, 146 people had been diagnosed with mad cow disease in the United Kingdom. Um, 
probably there's more than that now, but the last time I looked up data was in 2004. Some other cases. So creutzfeldt jakob is also a disease that can occur due to a spontaneous mutation. So it is not only acquired through um, eating a cow that had been sick. Um, notice that this person's brain has lost a lot of the gray matter that was in the neocortex on the outside. Um, this one is what a normal brain is supposed to look like. And so this is why a person who has mad cow can't control their muscles anymore. They can't really think very well. It's because their brain is degenerating. And if you were to look at it under a microscope, you'd see all those little holes too. Some other prion diseases, scrapie infects sheep. Mm. Um, Kuru is a really fascinating story, actually. Um, it comes from, I think, New Guinea. I, it's either New Guinea or New Zealand, but I'm pretty sure it's New Guinea. Um, there was a group of people, um, Aborigines, that lived in that area, and to honor their dead, they would eat their dead. And some of the dead people ended up with this disease that caused tremors, and then eventually brain death, and then they died they would still eat those people to honor their dead and therefore spread that disease to other people. And so this is one of the big reasons why we don't eat our dead people. It's because you can spread diseases like Kuru, which is sort of like mad cow, but you didn't get it from eating cow. You got it from eating your mom when your mom died. Um, this is the sheep version, scrapey off over here. Classic CJD is creutzfeldt jakob disease. This is the spontaneous mutation version, not the I ate a cow that I shouldn't have eaten version. And then this is normal brain right there. Um, this one, y'all can pause it to just kind of see. It shows you how prions convert normal proteins into bad proteins that make it a degenerative disease. Mm -hmm. uh, model organism for this chapter is the rhinovirus. What does it cause? Common cold. What kind of virus is it? It's a naked virus, so again, very difficult to kill. Um, what is this virus's route of entry for the body? It's a respiratory infection. Um, after that, you just have the very final thing for this chapter. Now, there's two ways that you can play this game. You can either go to that link and watch some of their videos. P.S. If that link is broken too, somebody needs to tell me. Um, watch the video, take notes on the video, provide me with a summary. If you do this, it can either count as an additional quiz grade, so you can drop a lower quiz grade, or it can be extra credit for exam three. So if you're submitting this assignment to me, your title should be what you want it to count for, either a quiz or extra credit so that I know how you want that grade to be applied. Good.